Most of the drawings used in manufacturing are multi-view drawings, meaning they represent the shape of an object in two or more views. For example, this detailed drawing contains three views of the part, the front, top, and right side. This unit will show you how to interpret a multi-view drawing and visualize the part it represents. This is an important skill because it will help you locate the part features you need to perform your job. We'll examine the principal views of the drawing, which establish the basic shape and features of the part. We'll also look at auxiliary views, partial views, and enlarged views, which are sometimes used to clarify the principal views. And we'll explain some drafting conventions, which are accepted methods of simplifying the representation of certain part features. Once you've completed this unit, you'll begin seeing parts from a multi-view perspective, which will make it easier for you to read drawings. To understand multi-views, it's helpful to know how the views are derived. Imagine that this part is enclosed in a transparent box, with its surfaces parallel to the sides of the box. Now suppose that the edges of the part are traced or projected onto the sides of the box. The resulting views are two-dimensional. They have height and width, but no depth. They're what you would see if you look directly at the sides of the part with your line of sight perpendicular to its surface. When the box is unfolded, you have the six principal views of a multi-view drawing. Front, top, right side, left side, bottom, and rear. They define the basic shape and features of the part. This method of representing a three-dimensional object is called orthographic projection. There are two types of orthographic projection in use today. Third angle projections, like this one, are used in the United States and Canada. First angle projections are used in Europe and Asia. The difference between them lies in the arrangement of the views. For example, the right side view in a third angle projection appears on the left side in a first angle projection. The left side view appears on the right, and the top view appears on the bottom. Since this affects how you visualize the part, it's important to know which type of projection you're looking at. Therefore, each one has been assigned a symbol by the International Organization for Standardization, abbreviated ISO. The ISO symbol may or may not appear on a drawing. It's often omitted from drawings done in the United States since they're assumed to be third angle projections. When the ISO symbol is used, it appears next to or inside the title block. Getting back to the principal views. The number included on the drawing depends on the shape and complexity of the part. Most drawings include two or three principal views, usually the front, top, and right side. However, a simple part, such as this gasket, requires only one view to define its shape and size, along with a note specifying its thickness. A more complex part, such as this clamp, requires three views. The ability to visualize the part from these drawings is an important skill because it enables you to locate features quickly. It's easy once you understand the relationship between the views, as well as some of the visual tricks an orthographic view plays on the untrained eye. As an example, look at the front, top, and right side views of this part. We'll add a pictorial drawing to make it easier to visualize. The front view is the one that best characterizes the overall shape of the part. The other views are aligned with the front so that it's easy to identify related features. For example, the bottom of the notch in the right side view corresponds to this hidden line in the front view. Adjacent views have at least one edge in common. For example, these lines represent the same edge. A surface appears as a plane in one view and an edge in another, depending on your line of sight. Let's look at another part. Notice 
that the curved surface appears flat in the front and right side views, and that the inclined surface appears foreshortened in the top and right side views. Because an orthographic view has only two dimensions, height and width, curved and inclined surfaces will appear distorted in some views. That's why it's important to look at all the views in order to understand the true shape and size of a part. With these factors in mind, let's look at one of the model parts included in this training program. These are the front, top, and right side views. The front view best represents the overall shape of the part. The top view reveals its curved surfaces. The hole and counter bore are visible in the top view and hidden in the front and right side views. Their centers are indicated by center lines, which are aligned between the front and top views to establish that these are related features. The cutout is visible in the front view. In the top and right side views, it's represented by hidden lines. By identifying related features in this manner, you can begin to visualize the shape of the part. Let's pause to review. Multi-view drawings are generated by orthographic projection, a drafting technique in which the edges of the part are projected onto the sides of an imaginary glass box. This results in six principal views. Most drawings include only two or three principal views, usually the front, top, and right side. Reading the drawing involves identifying related features from view to view and visualizing the part that is represented. There are two types of orthographic projection, third angle and first angle, which differ primarily in the arrangement of views. They are identified on the drawing by an ISO symbol. Most drawings done in the United States are third angle projections. The majority of machine parts can be completely described in two or three principal views. However, when principal views alone are inadequate, additional views are used to clarify them. They include the auxiliary view, partial view, and enlarged view. For the remainder of this unit, we'll focus on these three views, beginning with the auxiliary view. An auxiliary view is used to show the true shape and size of an inclined surface. An inclined surface does not lie parallel to any side of the glass box. As a result, it appears foreshortened in the principal views. This presents a problem if the inclined surface contains holes or other important features which must be dimensioned and shown without distortion. So another side is added to the glass box parallel to the inclined surface. Projecting the inclined surface onto this side allows us to look directly at the inclined surface and see its true shape and size. Hidden lines and other details are usually omitted unless they're needed to improve clarity. On the drawing, the auxiliary view is projected from the inclined surface where it appears as a line, in this case in the front view. To visualize its relationship to the front view, imagine that the inclined surface is hinged at this edge and can be lifted toward you. Here is another example. Neither the front nor top view accurately represents the shape and size of the inclined surface. The auxiliary view, projected from the edge of the inclined surface in the front view, shows its true shape and size. Again. To visualize its relationship to the front view, imagine that the inclined surface is hinged at this edge and can be lifted toward you. A partial view is sometimes used in place of a complete view to save space or to simplify the drawing. For example, here is a partial view of the top of this part. A break line indicates where the view is broken off. Since the part is symmetrical, a partial view showing half the part 
is sufficient to describe its shape and size. Partial views are also used to clarify a feature without having to resort to another complete view. For example, in this drawing, it appears as though these edges are at right angles to each other. A partial right side view reveals that they are in fact curved. An enlarged view is used to show a feature in greater detail than is possible in a principal view. For example, this part has two grooves which are too small to dimension clearly. So one of the grooves is enlarged and located wherever there is room for it on the drawing. The enlarged view and the circled area it represents are identified by the same letter. An enlarged view has a different scale than the rest of the drawing. In this case, it's four times scale, meaning that the groove has been enlarged to four times its actual size. Here's another example. In this case, the gear teeth circled in the front view are enlarged to four times scale. This allows them to be dimensioned clearly. Let's pause to review. Auxiliary views, partial views, and enlarged views are used to help clarify the principal views. An auxiliary view is used to represent an inclined surface, which would appear foreshortened in a principal view. A partial view is sometimes used for symmetrical parts to save space on the drawing. A break line indicates where the view is broken off. A partial view is also used to clarify a feature without having to resort to a complete view. An enlarged view is used to show a feature in greater detail than is possible in a principal view and to allow room for dimension. In drafting, there are some accepted methods of simplifying the representation of certain part features. They're known as conventions. Although they deviate slightly from true orthographic projection, conventions save drafting time and improve the clarity of the drawing. Once you recognize and understand some of these conventions, you'll be able to interpret drawings more easily. The first has to do with line precedence. That is, what happens when two lines on the drawing coincide. For example, in the right side view of this part, the visible line representing this edge lies directly over the hidden line representing this edge. It's not possible to show both lines, so one of them must take precedence or priority over the other. The visible line takes precedence. The rules of line precedence are that a visible line always takes precedence over a hidden line or a center line, and that a hidden line takes precedence over a center line. Here's another example. In the right side view of this part, the visible lines representing these edges take precedence over the hidden lines representing the holes, and the hidden line representing this edge takes precedence over the center line of the whole. The convention of line precedence ensures that the drawing represents the part as clearly as possible. Another drafting convention concerns the use of break lines. A break line indicates where a view is broken off. There are different styles of break lines to represent different types of breaks. A wavy break line is used for a short break. A jagged break line is used for a long break. Another style is used for breaks in rods and tubes. Break lines are also used to indicate that a portion of a long uniform part has been removed. This is sometimes done to save space on the drawing. Phantom lines are another drafting convention. They serve several purposes. They're used to indicate that a part is movable and to define the extent of its movement. They're used to represent the position of an adjacent part and thus help clarify the relationship of components in an assembly. 
And to save drafting time, phantom lines are used to represent repetitive detail, such as these gear teeth and spring coils. Brake lines and phantom lines are part of the alphabet of lines. You'll find a complete alphabet in the general reference section of your application guide. The drafting conventions we've discussed so far, line precedents, brake lines, and phantom lines, concern the interpretation of lines. This next drafting convention concerns the altering of a principal view in order to avoid foreshortening certain features. For example, the top view of this part indicates that it has three webs and three lugs. In the front view, which is drawn according to true orthographic projection, this web and this lug appear foreshortened. As a result, the front view does not accurately represent their shape, nor their relationship to the hub. In cases like this, it is conventional for the front view to be drawn as though the web and lug were rotated into alignment. Although it's not a true orthographic projection, this view more clearly represents the shape of the part. Meanwhile, the top view shows the true relationship between the webs, lugs, and hub. This convention of rotating features into alignment is applied to any part with radial elements, such as webs, lugs, arms, or spokes. Let's review these drafting conventions. Conventions are accepted methods of simplifying the representation of certain part features. Visible lines take precedence over hidden lines and center lines. Hidden lines take precedence over center lines. Brake lines are used to indicate where a view has been broken off. The style of the brake line reflects the size of the brake. Brake lines are also used to indicate that a portion of a long, uniform part has been removed to save space on the drawing. Phantom lines are used to represent the alternate position of a moving part, the position of an adjacent part, and repetitive detail. When true orthographic projection of features such as webs, lugs, ribs, and spokes would result in their foreshortening, they are rotated into alignment. The resulting view shows their true shape and proportion. In this unit, you've seen how the principal views of a drawing are derived through orthographic projection and how to identify related part features from view to view. You've also seen how auxiliary views, partial views, and enlarged views are used to help clarify the principal views. Your ability to interpret these views will help you to visualize a part more easily. It will also help you to understand sectional views, which are covered next in Unit 3.